Uh, reinventing international development. Um, so a little quick introduction, who that, what they do. Uh, I'm with Forum One. We're a full digital uh, service agency that crafts solutions for the world's most influential organizations. Um, so what sets us apart from every other digital shop out there? Uh, we're not a one and done. We build client relationships with our um, um, customers. We're passionate. We're creative. Um, and But most of, most of all, we're strategic um, in who we choose. So um, we are very selective in our RFP process. We deal with nonprofits, associations, government organizations that are trying to make a difference in the world. Um, some of the clients that are our feature clients are uh, Farm to Census, uh, Center for Global Development, Robert Wood Johnson, Bill Gates Foundation, um, Smithsonian, and the one I'm going to be talking about today, the Global Innovation Exchange um, for the USAID. So a little bit about me. I'm Chad Shellman, technical architect, Drupal evangelist, uh, author for Drupal 8 theming a twig, big proponent of uh, utilizing Pattern Lab with um, twig and, and Drupal 8 to generate Drupal 8 twig templates automatically. We did a presentation on that yesterday. If uh, you didn't get a chance, make sure you check that out. Some uh, groundbreaking stuff with Drupal 8. Oh, and by the way, the obligatory, we're, we're hiring. So <laughs> if you're, this sounds like something you're interested in uh, doing, make sure you stop by the four month booth. Always looking for uh, some crazy developers. All right, so what are we going to cover with uh, reinventing, reinventing international development? Um, first of all, I'm, I'm going to start off not by telling you what we do, how we do it. Everybody can do that. So I'm actually going to start off by telling you a story um, and, and a very interesting client kickoff meeting that we had. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about and show you some examples of how we use creative design to kind of lead the direction, uh, both strategically but also creatively, um, and how we use Pattern Lab to do that. Um, I'm also going to talk about long form content. Um, I don't know how many people realize this, but nobody reads your PDFs anymore. Okay, PDFs are dead. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about how we handle that scenario. Um, Search, search up makes everything in the in, in web nowadays. I'm going to talk about a little bit of solar, but how we actually extended solar. Um, and really impressively, I think, to, at least to me, is we took a, a government agency website and went from design to completion in 100 days, which I don't know if you ever had a, a government client or if there was any government clients in here. Um, that's almost unheard of, <laughs> uh, especially with uh, the bureaucracy nowadays. So um, it all started with a seed. So what do I mean by that? So this is a, mor a moronga seed. So in the deserts of South Africa, uh, vegetation is obviously really scarce on, on how it grows, but actually there's a, a moronga tree that actually produces this seed. So, how, so what does this have to do with global innovation and uh, what I have to talk about today? Well, for this kickoff meeting with Alexis Bonnell at uh, USAID, it started with not getting in a room with her stakeholders. It actually started with getting on a plane getting on a plane and flying to Boston, getting off a plane in Boston, driving to MIT, going to the D labs in MIT and actually looking at different inventions and innovations that were being developed not only by MIT, but all the smart students that were actually attending MIT, such things as washing machines connected to bicycles because there's no power for them or solar lanterns. Um, but the one that was most interesting was this machine that looked like kind of a, a bingo ball tumbler. <clears throat> and it, what it was, it was to deshell these very hard moronga seeds. And I don't know if you've ever even heard of a moronga seed, but these are used for medicinal purposes, which at the time I wasn't aware of. So I said, can you eat one? <laughs> and they said, well, yes, you can eat, <laughs> eat them. They're actually used for in some places for uh, weight loss. So. Alexis, the wild client she was, said, okay, everybody, grab a seed, we're all going to eat one. So we ate one, and it was fine, chewed for a couple of minutes, and then probably about 20 seconds into it, it felt like somebody had taken my mouth and rinsed it out with an antiseptic. Continued to walk around probably for about 30 minutes after that, not being able to feel my face, my tongue. Uh, long story short, though, a lot of times we don't get a chance when we're building something to actually feel it to touch it, smell it, use our other senses. We're always focused on the visual aspects of a website. Being able to actually have this opportunity was probably one of the most uh, exciting, actually, aspects of it because 
once I was able to actually feel it, touch it, smell it, when it came to actually sitting down and doing content strategy, when it came to doing design, it put everything in a lot better perspective than what we have done on a lot of projects. So what does that all look like? Um, so real, really quickly, I'm going to talk about creative, pattern lab, long form content, solar, and um, the 100 days that it took for us to build this website. So I'm not a big proponent of slides, so let's go ahead and exit out here and go into uh, what I call demo time. So this is the home page of Global Animation Exchange. Um, we were actually able to start design on this before we even started looking at content strategy, at content types, fields, UX, um, by utilizing something called Pattern Lab. Anybody here use Pattern Lab? A couple of people, okay. Pattern Lab allows us to actually create atoms, molecules, organisms, templates, and pages all within static HTML, CSS, SAS, that we can then turn around and utilize these actually to build out the web pages in Drupal. This is actually what it kind of ex expedited us being able to kick off the, the project so at the time that the development actually caught up, it took two weeks to actually theme the, the site in full because we had already done the design, design work utilizing the Pattern Lab. And the nice thing about Pattern Lab, if you haven't seen it, is you know, it's responsive in nature. So you can already start testing for particular you know, break points. You can see the color palette, the way that, that fonts look like, um, you know, the way that different elements look like. And as you start to break this down from atoms to molecules, you start taking these the most finite component of this and you start building upon it until you get to the point where you can actually say, okay, well, what's the homepage gonna look like? Okay, this is not Drupal, this is actually Pattern Lab, but you can actually see, you know, interaction, what card styles are gonna look like, um, you know, what staff picks, funding opportunities, so that the, when it got, came to time actually theming it, we we're actually able to actually put it back over into Drupal very easily. Okay. Next thing I want to talk about is search, okay, with, with solar. So people are used to Google search, um, people are used to database search, but when you start talking about 3,000 innovators, uh, thousands of funders, resources, and, and pieces of content that people are looking at, because here's, here's the challenge behind um, a website like this, is this is a community-based website with users um, but funders are actually coming to look to say, okay, well, how many people are actually building a solar lantern? And believe it or not, um, prior to this site being built, there was over 350 people building pretty much the same solar lantern. Okay? Um, so now we actually have a place to crowdsource that information, be able to actually have uh, funders and resources come in and actually take a look you know, at innovations that are, are available. Um, they can quickly do it at a glance. Um, to look at the different information that, that's you know being innovated on the stages of it, the cost per unit, where it's being created, where it's um, sector and, and area that's supposed to be developed for, um, so that funders and are able to actually get a, you know a really quick glance, and it's also giving the innovators a marketplace, so to speak, to be able to actually put their innovations um, and actually have people be able to find them. It also allowed for innovators to actually get together and talk to each other and possibly even partner up to say, you know, well, we're all, there's 10 of us building the same exact solar lantern, let's pull our resources and make one really kick-ass solar lantern. Okay, so that site provided the ability to do that. Uh, but, they, but because there were so many innovations coming in, you know, they needed to be able to wait to, to um, provide a really nice search mechanism for this. So we implemented solar, and, and yes, anybody can go and implement solar, doesn't take a lot to create a solar index view or you know, to create facets to be able to filter information down based off of you know, different fields and keywords. Um, but where this actually really came in handy was for the actual innovators or users of this community that actually were logged in. Because actually what we're, we were able to do with that is generate some, you know, a custom dashboard utilizing those same concepts with solar. So not only were they being able to see you know, organizations and, and, and money being funded and, and the amount of resources in there, but they were also, as an innovator, we were able to actually take those solar indexes and make more like this functionality. So they're actually able to see what's my competition? What are other people around me that have maybe favored in my innovation also looking at? Um, 
And so it would give us a, a, a ability to actually really extend upon solar's capabilities with something that's really not available um, out of the box with, with Drupal in a, in a module, but actually writing you know custom, custom uh, code that actually talked to solar in the back end. Um, taking that you know one step further, we were, we were actually able to build, build these dashboard pages uh, utilizing that. Um, but then it came to the point where they were saying, well, I have this really long PDF. And we were like, nobody's gonna read your PDF. You need to make your PDF of your innovation or the information you're trying to share your innovation or the resource that you're trying to upload more interactive to the user, okay? So how many people here are familiar with long form content? A couple, okay? So since people, especially depending on where they're at, their, their main medium, medium actually might be a phone. People are used to scrolling on phones now, okay? So that's translated now over to browsers as well. People don't have a problem scrolling through long pieces of content as long as the content is interactive, as long as it's engaging, okay? So what we did is actually turned around and made long form content fun to look at, okay? And we did this inside a Drupal tour. They could actually develop and build these pages by themselves without actually having a developer or a designer have to interact with them, okay? So you, you may have been asking, well, you know, is this just a basic page? How are these components being developed? Um, what's the flexibility that they have? Um, you know, and those are all great questions. What we ended up using is simply <laughs> is paragraphs bundle. Anybody familiar with paragraphs? Okay. So we're actually able to, to generate you know, long form content pages utilizing different paragraph bundles, which allowed us to create you know, a long form image or an aside or a section break and let the client put it back in the client's hand to actually take a look at their PDF and actually build these pages dynamically utilizing this functionality. Um, all this together, though, actually, you know, it's, it was able to speed up the process. Um, and we're, so between Pattern Lab, between the long-form content and the solar, we're able to make this really robust community-based web website for innovators, for funders, um, and for places for resources, um, to, you know, to be almost like a central marketplace. Um, and we were able to do that really fast, 100 days. Um, you know, I worked on a lot of projects. I've been a technical architect, a front-end developer, a front-end manager many different facets um, on many different projects, and this was probably by far the fastest. Now, I will say, if this was a Drupal 8 project, this would have been done about 30% faster. <laughs> um, but, you know, we had built this prior to, prior to Drupal 8 being released. Um, but if, you ha you know, if, if you're looking at getting ready to start a project, by all means, take a look at Drupal 8. Um, that's all I had, real quick, fast, you know, skinny of, of what we did on that particular project how we're able to turn that around in 100 days. Um, are there any questions? No? All right, well that was reinventing International Development. Again, um, Chad told me Forum 1. If you have any questions after this, feel free to stop by our booth. Thank you. HDMI in here somewhere, isn't there? Yeah, at the end of that. Yep, you saw plug it. Yeah. That's there, so you can okay, stick that in there.
All right. Thanks for, I guess I'll stand here. Thanks for uh, coming to the, this presentation. So I'm with Smartling. I'm a solutions architect, which is the post-sales integrations person that really helps clients once Smartling's you know, made the sale, helps the clients actually integrate with our technology. I'll be presenting with uh, two guys from uh, the Weather Company, who the Drupal co uh, community knows much more at this point than uh, Smartling. And so we're really happy to be able to do this with them, kind of use their power to get our name out there, and kind of you know tout the success that we found together with our partnership. Um, and I'll introduce them when we come to, uh, when I hand that off to them. So, and the presentation that I want to present here is translating actually into other languages uh, and localizing content. So localizing a little more, you know, if you have images and other media that isn't just pure translation, but actually you want, uh, you know, those of the community that you're marketing to or presenting your content to, you might want to present different content, not even just translation. So translating and localizing content in Drupal uh, using the media current presentation framework. So let me get that. <clears throat> So for those who are interested in getting the presentation, I'll put this up at the end too, uh, before DrupalCon, you know, downloading the presentation through the official DrupalCon site, you can go to uh, this short URL and grab the presentation right now if interested. Uh, and you can look at that after. We have some more slides at the end of this presentation that um, go into more details on the technical integration. So you might be interested in downloading that presentation, looking at those slides, and of course coming by uh, Smartling has a uh, booth, uh, 703, kind of on the far, when you go in all the way to the right. So feel free to stop by and uh, ask us any more questions that you don't get answered here. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about Smartling. So we are a translation um, software company that simplifies the process of managing and delivering global content. That's a strictly a marketing spiel there. So really what that means is our, our company, if, if, if your company is looking to go global very quickly, scale, but also not manage, you know, not requiring a team of 20 to 30 people managing your translation process, uh, that's where Smartling comes into play. So we, three main kind of points that I want, to, want you to take away about Smartling is what we provide is one, uh, visibility. So let me go through here. Um, so here's our, our main uh, product is, we call it the Global Fluency Platform. Um, and so with this product, this comes with both the kind of technical back end for actually moving data around and getting that translated, as well as being a platform for reporting, keeping track of your translations and content, and actually having translators go in and do the translations themselves. Smartling alone doesn't employ translators, but we have uh, relationships with translation agencies to do the translations. Uh, human, actual, real translations uh, versus uh, machine translation. And we also allow, if you're a company like Weather, who came to us and they already had a relationship with uh, translation vendors, we onboard them into our system. So we're agnostic, more flexible with those who are doing the actual translation, but we're that platform capturing content and allowing the translators to come to one place to do the translation. So the three pieces I want you to remember is one, visibility and control. Um, there's other vendors out there that are in our fear, uh, field that kind of offer a product uh, that's a black box. So they say, hey, you come to us, we're the one-stop shop. Just don't worry about what's happening in between. Just give us content. It'll get translated and reviewed, and we'll just deliver it back to you. You have no control, but that's great because you don't need a control. You have no input into the service, but we're going to deliver this back to you on time, and you're kind of stuck with what you got. So in our system, we automate a lot of the process of pulling content into the system, but you have visibility throughout the whole process. You can see as the content's moving through translation, you no longer have to reach out to Smartling or your translation vendor to say, hey, you promised that this content would be done by a certain date. Where are you in that process? How much have you actually translated? In Smartling, you're able to log in to our dashboard as, as a content owner and actually in one shot be able to see you know, the translators uh, going through translating content, and if they have any questions or concerns, they can raise those issues right through the Smartling interface, and it kind of just simplifies it all into one place to get your reporting and status of the content. Two, improved productivity slash scaling your business. So one thing that Weather is gonna talk a lot about here coming up is how they were already 
you know, to some extent successfully localizing and translating their content, but they were running into a place where they didn't want to hire more people to go to even more languages. It wasn't a very scale, it wasn't scaling very well for them. So Smartling really allows you to have, you know, one person instead of 10 manage n number of languages. You know, this one person, if you add 10 more languages on top of the 30 you already have, you don't have to hire another person. That person, after a few clicks, can go ahead and send the same content they have for French and German. They can have that content go out for Italian and have it started translating within a day or two. At that point, all the pipes, you know, to get the data back into, say, in this case, Drupal or other content management systems, that's, that work has already been done. So all it is really is working on our platform to request translations for new uh, languages. And at that point, they can sit back, let the translations happen, and it'll automatically deliver to the um, place that will deliver to the end user. And three, fast time to market. This kind of goes along with the first two, but this, we do also, along with the quality and not being a black box, we do want to make sure you get to market quickly. So we do want to make sure that your content comes in as soon as it changes and updates. Your developers have created a new page in Drupal that comes automatically into Smartling. It gets to translators. They start translating right away, and they deliver that back, and it automatically comes back in your system. All of that other than the human translations themselves, we've automated the rest of that process so quickly you can scale from, say, 10 languages to 40 at one time without having to you know, add months onto your process to set everything up. Once the pipes are connected, you're all set to begin scaling to any number of languages you're looking to do or the volume of content. So let's talk, since this audience is a very targeted audience here for uh, Drupal, one of our connectors, as we call them, um, is a module for Drupal. So we actually have a module that, uh, for Drupal 7, and for Drupal 8, we're polishing kind of the final touches for the Drupal 8 module. But what this really allows you to do is, and whether, again, we'll kind of go into detail on how this helped them, is going to Smartling allows the content creators and the developers to have some initial integration with Smartling to kind of connect the module up to the Smartling project in database of record, once that's done, the content creators can go ahead either node by node, page by page, or say, you know, they can uh, send uh, in bulk, in a couple clicks, a whole bunch of content over to Smartling, select a few languages within the module in Drupal, and go ahead and commit, you know, 100,000 source words for German, French, and Italian with a couple clicks, and that sends right over to Smartling. They don't have to worry about packaging that together, tracking in Excel spreadsheets. Our module keeps track of all the content that's submitted. And um, some of the teams, you know, as you're going through, you don't want to necessarily have to wait for French to be done to get German and Italian. If German's already done, then our system automatically goes out once it's 100% complete, pulls that right in, automatically creates the node for that language. And uh, really, it makes it so once you connect those dots, your content creators can just go into uh, their keep to their standard process. but. As they're updating content, our module is picking that up, resending it for translation. Only the new content from before is getting translated, so they don't have to redo any work. Then it automatically comes back to Drupal. And so we have this in Drupal, but we also have these in many other channels, including WordPress, Sitecore, Adobe Experience Manager, Git repositories, et cetera. We have many other channels, so if Drupal, like I was just talking with the weather guys, is really only one path of content that needs to be translated, we also have the other uh, channels to get your content translated and leveraging uh, the same translations you've already done. And finally, from the Smartling side, I just want to say, kind of highlight, here's an animated GIF. It's probably hard to kind of see from back there, but a translator, when they come into Smartling, is going to, they don't need to log into Drupal. They don't need to log into WordPress to see the content. We actually capture with our Drupal module the visual, how the page actually looks. In, you know, if it was rendered on a web page. And as they're doing the translation, it actually dynamically puts it right into the interface so they can see, you know, is this breaking the user interface? Is this, um, they, instead of going back and forth via email, once they're done translating, you know, a developer looks at it and says, that's German word is, you know, 200% too long. That's an incredibly long word. I need that about half the length. The translators will see right here if it's breaking your user interface, oh, this is an alert box. Okay, I only have this much room. And that kind of cuts out that back and forth. So that's a big benefit that you get with the SmartLink system. So saying that, I will hand this over to Vishal, who's a senior engineer for web development at um, uh, weather.com or the weather company. And he's going to talk a little bit about weather's needs and why they chose SmartLink and the integration that we did. 
Good afternoon, every, good afternoon everybody. Uh, so in 2014, uh, we used to have our websites working on Java technology uh, using, uh, and translations for international sites was done through Java's resource bundles. We didn't have any translation management system uh, to connect and you know, record all the translations for all the different languages sites that we supported. We used to have our mobile website and our desktop website as separate entities. So just imagine uh, two different applications just for the website, and then we had uh, the iOS app, uh, the, the Windows app, as well as uh, Android app. All of these systems did not talk to each other in terms of translation. So each system had their own set of translations for almost similar terms. So like weather terms like pressure, humidity, wind, you know, all of those were like separately translated through their own translation, man translation vendors. And we didn't have a single repository to have uh, a, you know, a tab on the quality of translation or having a translation memory that we could leverage for all these properties. So uh, in 2014, uh, we started with the redesign of our, internet, uh, of, of our US site. Uh, let's see. So this is, this is a screenshot from one of the pages of our US site where uh, everything is in English, obviously. And at that time, when we launched the US site, our international sites were still on the older platform uh, with, with not unmanageable translations, uh, basically. So last year, when we started working towards a solution of internationalizing the new uh, framework using Drupal, uh, and so this website is currently working in Drupal 7, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, Angular modules, so Angular JavaScript modules. So each component on the page that you see is an Angular module by itself. And Drupal, Drupal renders the module uh, configuration and the, the module basically requests for all the translations and uh, any resources or uh, JavaScript or CSS by itself. So when we were supposed to uh, migrate this platform into the international sites, uh, we were looking for vendors and we did a, uh, we reached out to a few vendors and did a scorecard uh, on certain parameters that we had that needed to be fulfilled. Uh, so the, bigger, the big ones were a single uh, translation management system that we could use for uh, different platforms. So SmartLink did that job for us, uh, connecting uh, the apps through the GitHub, and the Drupal was done by um, our internal team uh, in con conjunction with MediaCurrent to come up with a solution for the Drupal module that, Drupal SmartLink module that uh, Dan talked about. So um, using uh, that framework, we were able to deliver like 38 or 39 sites uh, within a period of three to four months. So, so the US site took almost seven to eight months to build, but all 38 sites after that were just like integration of uh, SmartLink Drupal module uh, with our systems, with our Drupal system to uh, roll out all those sites. And it was pretty se seamless. Once the solution was in place, uh, without going through development cycle, uh, the product manager or the localization man manager could roll out any number of locales directly by uh, doing some configuration changes within uh, SmartLink interface and Drupal interface that we have. So little to no development work involved and they can roll out sites at will. Uh, so basically the, these were the requirements for you know, selecting uh, SmartLink. Uh, let me go to the next slide. All right, so here comes the Drupal technical expertise that Patrick is going to talk about how those things were meshed together to come up with the solution. This is Patrick. Hello, my name is Patrick Birch. I work for weather.com, the weather company, of course. And uh, basically, how this works is SmartLink provides an, a wrapper around the entity API. So that's how it can get all of your nodes and taxonomy terms and everything translated into the system. But weather.com doesn't really have that as its primary interface, because we have the Angular mods. So with the help of SmartLing, we, they wrote an extra module to help translate our special Angular mods. And those, uh, those made it really easy to get everything localized to every other language. 
And uh, yeah, the loose coupling. <clears throat> the loose coupling. It. Uh, yeah, basically how it how it helps is that uh, we can pr produce an Angular mod with the PO files that have the strings to be translated. And then whenever those are committed into the repo, they, we can go to our test environment or staging and go ahead and submit them from there. And once they get submitted and they start getting translated and they're complete and they get downloaded, then we can test and verify on a lower environment before they ever get pushed to production. And once it makes it to production, all you have to do is download the strings and it's done. And it makes it really easy to make sure that everything is very fail safe. And here's an example of the interface. And I'm going to turn it back over to Vishal, who actually uses this interface. All right, so this is the interface that Smartling and uh, our CMS team built uh, for basically the product development team, including the web development team and product managers, QA team, uh, everybody in, involved with the product development, basically. So. This is an example of a screen where uh, you can see there's a Glomo Forecast Weekend module, so which is nothing but like glo global mobile uh, module that basically serves the weekend forecast, so like Friday, Saturday, Sunday data, that you could find that on our website. So this is an Angular module uh, with certain labels and uh, phrases that need to be translated. So. Each Angular module has a PO file, uh, which is basically uh, a, a key value pair of message ID and message string, if you guys are not aware of what PO file is. So the message ID message string is basically written by the developers when they are building the module, and uh, we use a directive using the Drupal's PF translate. Uh, so we have an Angular directive that actually talks to the Drupal PF translate uh, module or I don't know what that what do you call in Drupal. Well, it's the locales module. Yes, locales module. So uh, uh, each of those PO files will have a certain number of strings. So so basically, the, what it represents is this module is uh, shown up here. When you click on it and select translate, uh, you'll see the screen on the right side. So basically, the first screen is the first page when you go to the submission screen where you actually have to translate into whatever languages you want to s translate into. And the next screen is the one where you actually select the locales. So let's say we have the forecast module only available on 10 of our 40 sites. So you go ahead and just select those 10 languages or locales and select and submit it. Uh, once it's submitted, it goes into the workflow system and our localization manager the product manager for localization, he actually reviews the request that comes from a developer and sees whether the request is valid for all those locales, and then he'll approve or disapprove or you know, send it back to the developer depending upon the requirements. So let's say if the developer by accident selected all 40 locales, and that module is only going to be used for eight language sites. So there's no point translating it for all those 40 languages because each translation has a cost associated to it. So he can review that and just get those eight uh, translated. Once the translation is done, uh, we see the screen. Uh, the, this is the SmartLing. Uh, uh, the submission screen. No, it's not the submission. I think this is the is it a submission screen. Yeah, it's showing the progress of all these. Yeah, the progress. Yeah. yeah, so progress screen. Basically, yeah. so it shows you for each locale for that module uh, was the progress. So here we have captured a screenshot that actually has 100% on every different locale, but you could have an example where the Spanish and French and German are all 100%, but you know, uh, uh, some other uh, locale like Arabic or some other are like just 40%. So you could download the translations as they keep coming. Uh, normally the turnaround time for a regular English or uh, Latin, uh, you know, Latin uh, character sites is one to two days. For more complex Asian languages like Chinese, Korean, Arabic specifically, it takes up to three to four days. But they have their SLAs defined for getting the translations unless there's a, uh, on a case-to-case -case basis, you may have some, uh, uh, you know, unusual, unusual yeah. But, but mostly it's like within three to four days, you get all your translations back. So basically it's a pretty quick turnaround 
And the good thing is, if you have a string that's already translated, you don't have to go back to the translators because the translation management system or the translation memory will actually get back the string for you. And let's say a feature rolled out for the app and they had 10 different strings being translated. So the translation memory will have those 10 strings translated in different languages. So if for the website, we go and build a similar module and with similar eight or 10 different strings, you get that automatically without having to go through the translation. So that cuts down on a lot of uh, uh, cost that we had to be associated for getting it translated through the translation vendors that uh, we could get you know, very streamlined using the SmartLink module and TMS system. Uh, this is an example of the screen, uh, basically similar screen to how we had uh, for US, but you see the same Angular module using the PO file translations can serve all different kinds of languages. Uh, we have example of Spanish, uh, we have example of Chinese, and the second one is actually right to left language site, which is an Arabic site, because they read right to left, not left to right as regular languages. So, so we, 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 were, we were able to accomplish all of these using that um, solution. So, yeah, so any questions, comments? Bring them on. You've got to that mic. Yeah. 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 Um, like, this is more curiosity and not directly related to the smartening integration, but mm -hmm. um, how do you handle what language what user sees? Like, do you have like, different domains? And do you read them automatically? We, uh, so, we used to have different domains, subdomains like uh, es.espanol.weather.com or fr.weather.com. Uh, with the latest Google uh, SEO you know, um, pra best practices, what we found out that having a single domain and then having the locale as part, as a subpath, uh, is, yeah, like a subfolder, like weather.com slash frfr or weather.com slash dede actually ranks better with Google because then it thinks all these properties are from weather.com. And uh, if you have subdomains, we have a lot of issues with cookie management and stuff because subdomain cookies might interfere with your base domain cookies and whatnot. Uh, local storage has problems. So now with, uh, with this, you, can, you don't have to worry about those issues as well as have a better SEO ranking with Google. So that's how we manage uh, currently since last, last year. Do you use a language selector or do you auto-detect their IP? Uh, currently, we do an accept language and the IP, both. And if you go to the, if, if you are in Germany and you go to weather.com, it will uh, detect, if you, if you have a browser that has an accept language as German, it will take you to the German site, weather.com slash dede, and also say, say that we detected you are in Germany with a German language browser, so we have redirected you to German, German site. If you really want to go back to the US site, click here, and then they, they can opt out of that. But by default, only on the home page we do that because we don't want users with deep link uh, like the Today page or any of the forecast pages, if they are already having a bookmarker coming from Google, we don't want them to be forcefully redirected to the, the, their language site. So they have an option to select it from the dropdown in the header. So another question back there? Yeah. So right now, <clears throat> we're just working out the final, some uh, final pieces to that to kind of polish that off and get that ready. Um, that ETA on that, I'm always careful being on the client services side. I'm not allowed to give any dates or, you know, um, always get bit by those when, when that happens. But very soon, we're, it's the final pieces to that. We're going to get that out the door extremely quickly. That's the highest priority right now for our Drupal developers is getting that out the door since there's so much hype. On the other side, of course, it's related to people adopting Drupal 8 too. And so I think, you know, once our clients that we have, which you have a few, are starting to dip their toes into Drupal 8, that's incentive to get that finalized and out the door. So I know that wasn't an exact time for you, but very soon.
Short answer is yes. We support, um, we to some extent, uh, Smartling attempts to be, you know, uh, agnostic or uh, doesn't care about the actual source of that content. So get text or PO is one example, but we support, you know, um, Android and uh, strings files. We support Xlif. We support custom XML support, um, Java properties, et cetera. And you can find more on our, our website at docs.smartling.com if you're interested in seeing what different file types. But we know like Drupal, I think the common ones are get text, Xlif, and XML is, and we support all those through the module. Yeah kind of dependent on how that content is stored. Any other uh, questions? Vishal, do you want to talk a little bit about like the day in the life of a string and how you kind of, the steps a developer creates a new module or an update and kind of how that moves through the system? Sure. Just kind of simplify that. Yeah. So let's say a request for a new module or feature comes from the product team. Um, and it comes back to the developer. So they start working on, the, uh, on, on that module basically based upon the design mocks. Design mocks may have some strings um, on them already. So when you are building the HTML uh, or if, if a certain thing needs to be shown as a dynamic value coming from a JavaScript web service or whatnot, we identify if that's, that data is going to be a dynamic data. So we need to make sure that the system that actually provides us the data has the translations available for whatever languages we are going to support. If it's a static string that's going to be a, like a label on our uh, web page, uh, we externalize all those English labels into the PO file, create the PO file from the local Drupal instance as well. Uh, when you're developing, you can go to the SmartLink module in your local Drupal instance and submit for translations. So you can do that from your local uh, once your local instance actually pushes the content over to the uh, translation management system and the localization manager approves that translation, it goes through to the SmartLink system where, they, uh, where the translators receive the request for translating into various languages. Uh, so I think first uh, SmartLink checks if the, if the string is already translated. If not, then only it goes to the translation man managers. Uh, so, we get back the strings within two or three days. You know, depends. Just depends if it's like machine translated coming already coming from the memory. It's instantaneous. Maybe the same day you'll receive it because the 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 push and pull happens through a uh, through a cron job. So Drupal has a cron job running where it sends the uh, pushes the content to SmartLink and receives Smart SmartLink uh, translated content automatically. So it just depends upon what what's the um, what's the time frame that you have the cron set up for. So on production, I think it's pretty frequent. Some of our test environments it might not be, so you can go and actually run those cron, cron jobs through a through your uh, run cron uh, interface in Drupal. So once the translations are received, uh, it just uh, it's just available in whatever environment. So let's say your development is com completed and it goes into QA uh, QA boxes can just go and download those translations. So they, uh, currently we uh, do a submit and download, but the submission is actually just like a trigger in that environment to fetch the translations. Because we made that uh, decision, concept decision, because let's say a module is already there in production uh, and you have a request to change that, some, something in that module, and you are either changing the label or doing something else with one of the existing labels. So you don't want the production module to get affected directly by uh, a change that you did in the development or QA environment. So we uh, made a conscious, conscious decision of not automatically downloading it, though SmartLink did provide us that uh, opportunity to uh, use it, because we didn't want to corrupt production with any development or QA uh, you know, changes. So. Whenever there's a change, uh, you just go and sub submit for translation, and it should be there in SmartLink. It, it comes back automatically. But yeah, it's like a, it's, we, we currently do it manually just, just to uh, avoid any uh, uh, undue Control situations. Changes. Yes. So. Any other questions? Uh, currently, uh, we don't have anything that indicates that the translation is not available on the front end, at least, right. because uh, 
uh, the way the PO files work is you, you, you use the English fallback strings. So if you see that this thing is coming up in English, you know that this is still not translated. Unless something like uh, certain uh, words or phrases can be the same for like Spanish, like I'm not sure, like wind, I think in German and English, they both call wind. So it's really hard to say if it was actually translated. So you can go to the SmartLink interface, look for that PO module, and see if the translation is already completed because it will show you 100% or 80% or whatever percentage. If it's 100%, you are 100% sure that everything has translated. Yeah, and I think to add on that too, as far as it kind of depends on your workflow or process that you need and the business requirements. The simplest approach when automating the data into Smartling is to really conceptually say, you know, in general, I want this type of content, this module, from now until forever for these five or six languages or these target languages. And from there, Smartling, that module can, can whenever you update that content, the developer doesn't have to continuously submit that content. You've already said you want that module and our module, or that for that module, and our Smartling module in Drupal will pick that cha those changes up and resend to Smartling and does a diff at that point. You don't have to understand what is the differences. We will only pull that one new string in. But I guess short answer, in the Drupal interface, you won't necessarily know, you know that one sentence that's going to be that new string for translation. But you can trust only your updates and changes will Smartling send for translation. Did that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? Well, uh, the, the, the only things that will get sent for translation are translatable strings that are wrapped in the T function. So it works pretty much just like everything else in Drupal, like for nodes and taxonomy. It's like if it's... On meta tags, for example. Yeah, and meta yeah, tags. Yeah, on meta tags. Anything that, only the thing that could get translated. Pieces. Yeah. yeah. You can. So Kostya is actually, this is our actual, Drupal developers wrote the module, so. Yeah, so of course we can send the message when you for the translation. For example, if you know, we just reached it in our interface when you take the field. Right. That, that you want to be translatable, and then you just send. send so you, so so you can configure that. Short answer, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Are there other questions? Okay, let's go to the next screen here. Uh, as you probably know, if you've been to other events, please go on to our event on the DrupalCon uh, website and rate that you guys loved and enjoyed our, our presentation. <laughs> no, you can offensively rate, and so here's that, and um, thanks for coming. Thank you. Oh. And Smartling has a booth, 703. Please come by. We have charging dongles. If you need your phone to charge, we got what you need.